Okay. Thank you everyone for joining today's event, A Sociologist's Reflections on Discipline, Research, and Advancing Your Academic Career in the Cal State System, presented by Dr. Jose Munoz. This event is being hosted by the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center and the UCLA First Gen Alumni Network. The CSRC and FGAN at UCLA acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. My name is Rebecca Epstein, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Chicano Studies Research Center. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, the CSRC was established in 1969, along with UCLA's three other ethnic studies research centers that are now housed within the UCLA Institute of American Cultures. The CSRC's research mission is supported by five distinct components, a library with a special collections archive, an academic press, collaborative research projects, public and academic programs, and community-based partnerships. The CSRC Press publishes academic books, exhibition catalogs, and its LAN, a journal of Chicano studies, which is the premier journal in its field and just celebrated its 50th anniversary. Meanwhile, the CSRC Library holds the largest collection of Chicano Latino research materials in the US. We are currently operating remotely, but invite you to come visit us in 144 Haynes Hall once campus reopens. I would now like to introduce Jacqueline Espinosa, Vice President of the UCLA First Gen Alumni Network. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So I'm going to go ahead and cover what First Gen Alumni Network is. We are a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, diverse, and intersectional network. We provide mentorship, professional development, scholarship opportunities, civic engagement, and socials to our community. We recognize that the first gen identity goes beyond college and into the professional world and all things adult life. And we are here to support our members through all of life spaces. We are the first in the UC system and the first of its kind across the nation. And this is critically important because a third of UCLA undergraduates identify as a first generation college student. Um, they are the first in their family to attend college. At this time, I'm going to pass it over to our president, Diego and Shanini and Justin, so they can briefly introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Diego. I serve as president of the UCLA First Gen Alumni Network. I graduated in 2012 with Chicano Chicana Studies and a minor in education. Um, and then I started, I, I then started an MBA program after that. Um, and I currently serve as an officer at the California Community Foundation. And I get the incredible honor of working with Jacqueline and Chanini um, and Justin and Sia throughout our incredible work. So thank you so much for joining us. Hi everyone, my name is Shanini Jaimes. I serve as the communications director for the First Gen Alumni Network. I graduated in 2014 and I currently work as a legal assistant for the Central American Resource Center. Um, thank you everyone for being here and I'm excited for this event. Thank you both. I forgot to mention when I graduated, I graduated in 2014, um, political science, double major and Chicano studies major, minor in labor and workplace studies. And I currently work for UCLA government and community relations. So I'll go ahead and pass it back to Rebecca. Oh, I'm sorry, Justin, Justin, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Not that I need to, but <laughs> just, uh, hi, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Justin. I work at the Alumni Association um, at UCLA and I have the pleasure of um, being the staff liaison for um, the First Gen Alumni Network, um, which is such a great group. And um, I'm excited that they partnered with the CSRC to bring this event to you all today and um, excited to, to learn from Jose. So um, thank you for, for having us and being with us today. Okay, thank you, Jacqueline, Diego, Shanine, and Justin. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jose Munoz, Associate Professor of Sociology at Cal State San Bernardino. Dr. Munoz is the Institute of American Culture's Visiting Research Scholar in Residence at the CSRC for 2020-21. Dr. Munoz. 
thank you. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Rebecca Epstein and Jacqueline Espinosa for helping me organize this. Um, I'm, I was happy to be able to provide this kind of feedback and uh, you know ideas about my experience in in academia uh, to first gen scholars. Um, uh, I'm also happy that C, uh, the Chicano Studies Research Center and Afghan could collaborate today. So I'm um, really glad that uh, different bodies are working together um, through UCLA. Uh, thanks for all the great questions that you sent uh, when you registered. I've tried to incorporate them into my presentation and the ones that I didn't, we're, we're gonna leave for the Q&A period. My presentation breaks down into updating you all about my projects uh, for this year, um, my own trajectory in academia and what I observed in applying to CSUs and what I've noticed um, since I started my position in 2011. Um, first, I want to talk about my uh, research project and how I got into it. Um, I, uh, I, I've often talked to my students on uh, about graduate school, academia, applying to graduate school, that kind of thing. I've always done that. I've told them about my experiences in graduate school and why I, beca I became uh, an academic. Um, I never, uh, I never thought about. Um, the possibility that this might be a site of research, which is pretty odd uh, because uh, sociologists, I mean, one of the things that we study or one of the things that lead to our academic work um, is the fact that, uh, that we often study our biographies. And, and so I'd never imagined studying first-gen and working-class scholars. Um, uh, I am the first person in my family to go to college. Um, you know, my mom graduated, uh, or sorry, did not graduate high school, dropped out in ninth grade. Um, uh, my dad's from the state of Jalisco in Mexico, and uh, he tried to take English classes when he was, when he first got here to the US, but you know, just couldn't, didn't work in to his uh, work life. Um, uh, my dad uh, is a gardener. He's been that since forever. And uh, my mom worked, you know, different kinds of jobs, fast food. And then uh, close to my senior year in high school, she became a, a business owner. So we've had a, you know, my family had a long, uh, challenging trajectory over time. Uh, then things sort of changed when basically both my families, both my parents became business owners. So when I heard that the American Sociological Task Force on first generation and working class persons in sociology were holding uh, focus groups at, a, at the, our annual conference in the summer of 2018, I thought, sure, I can, I can comment on that. I can participate in a focus group on what it's like to come from a first gen and working class experience and what's that like being an academic now? Um, the, that experience uh, was important for me. Um, I, I got a lot of sharing with other scholars about their own particular experiences. Uh, the project leader uh, was in that focus group and uh, I emailed him about a month later, just asking how the study went and when we could we see the findings. And it's at that point he said, well, this project is going to go on for another two years. And he asked me if a spot opens up, would I take it? And I said, absolutely, um, because I, I've never been on a national study before. And so this was a really big opportunity for me to explore a different area of sociology and collaborate with uh, other scholars um, writing in this area. And so the project uh, explored uh, first these focus groups. Those focus groups eventually uh, were used uh, to create a survey. Uh, that survey was sent out to 5,000 members, both current and going back two years. Um, 
uh, as far as the membership is concerned. And we got back about 1,700 surveys. Um, and so that's uh, really where I'm at with the data that we've collected. It not only included standard survey questions, but open-ended questions. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, my work uh, for the first part of the year uh, involved exploring some of this data. Um, I'm just giving you one slide here and you see that I'm looking at uh, population by gender, first gen and working class, of course. And then I also have a lot of data looking at uh, where people fit within the faculty system. Are they non-tenured? Could they be a graduate student who's teaching uh, perhaps, or someone who's, so, uh, sorry, more specifically, someone who did everything but their dissertation and then now is just a full-time non-tenure track faculty member. It could be a postdoctoral scholar all the way through a full professor. And then I also have uh, in this sample of people, um, folks that teach at research institutions, all the way through to junior college institutions. So I have a good variety of, of Latino faculty that I'm looking at um, and their experiences uh, in academia, okay? Um, you see there at the top of the screen, the phrase hidden burdens. Um, I'm looking at how sociologists uh, from Latino background to, backgrounds are confronting a lot of the hidden labor, hidden burdens, the emotional labor that they face uh, as academics. Uh, so, for example, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm looking for in the open-ended responses is uh, how much faculty are, are confronted by mentoring. And mentoring is a big part of what we do, um, but it's often found that among non-white scholars that they do more mentoring. They do extra mentoring. <laughs> um, you know, so you can imagine a Latino faculty member being visited uh, by Latino students, uh, right? You can imagine this happening quite a bit if you're the only Latino faculty member at a particular institution, right? There's no one else uh, from a Latino background that students can relate to, so that they go to that particular professor uh, often. You might even get students from outside your major, right? Outside your college, because there's no one else that uh, someone that, that no one else that can talk to that particular student or that student doesn't feel that, that the other faculty can connect to them or answer the questions that they have, okay? And, you know, mentorship is obviously a good thing. Uh, it's a big responsibility that faculty have. Uh, however, what we're noticing is that Latino faculty don't get the credit uh, for this kind of extra mentorship, right? Uh, it's seen as somehow natural that you would be doing this, right? You're Latino, you have Latino students, so, you know, what's really the problem? Uh, why, would, why wouldn't you do this? Why do you think that this is something that you should get extra credit for? Um, and this, this the reason, one of the reasons why this matters is if you're the one doing all this extra mentorship, what is that pulling you away from? Uh, maybe prep time for your classes, maybe writing research papers or presenting at conferences or uh, preparing to pre present at conferences. All this extra time eats into the other things that you are also responsible for as a faculty member, okay? And then when it's time to apply for a permanent position, well, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that someone who is burdened by extra labor uh, is a uh, maybe behind or struggling at a certain point because they're, they're spending a lot of time with mentoring, right? Which I think a lot of faculty like doing. However, if you're doing more than your colleagues, then that, that isn't fair. Um, I also don't mind saying that when someone uh, white mentors uh, people from first gen or working class or non-white populations, it's kind of like they uh, reach the moon. Um, they've poured so their, themselves into this kind of mentorship and they're given extra cred as extra weight. And, you know, when I see that, I'm like, well, I've been here doing that, you know, but it's not weighted the same. And so I'm looking at these kinds of burdens uh, among other kinds of issues that faculty are facing. Okay. And so I'm, I'm close to wrapping up a paper that I'll be submitting to 
uh, a journal. And then the next step uh, will be to conduct interviews. So this I just got approved to conduct my interviews with Latino faculty across different kinds of institutions. I'll be targeting mainly faculty at California institutions for now. And I'll be interviewing faculty uh, winter and spring quarter all the way through June uh, when my time at UCLA ends. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm really looking to explore more many of the themes that we found uh, in, in uh, the survey. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, don't worry about writing down what's on the next slide. Again, this is being recorded, uh, but I got a couple of requests about what kinds of literatures I'm looking at. Um, and there is an ample amount of research out there that I'm able to draw from uh, for my study, uh, looking at different populations, uh, various questions uh, from, uh, uh, from the undergraduate level to uh, moving on to uh, serving as a faculty member, okay? And other issues that faculty are facing, such as discrimination, um, stress, and other uh, issues that emerge. Um, so for example, uh, it's not uncommon for Latino faculty to be asked to serve on diversity committees. Oh, so you look like you know someone like uh, something about diversity. Why don't you serve on this committee? Right, and one committee seems fine, but that can add up to several. And so again, it becomes an issue of this extra work that's important to the university, certainly to the students, pulls you away from the other things that people are looking at when it's time uh, for you to become, uh, when it's time for you to come, come up for uh, a tenured position, yeah. Um, and so that's where I'm at. I'm moving on into the interviews and I'm hoping that the interviews go well which I, I'm looking to lead into another paper to be written sometime during the summer. Okay, so that's my research uh, for this point. Uh, this point, uh, why don't we go on to the next slide. Um, I got some other questions having to do with becoming a professor or what is my own particular research trajectory, uh, PhD trajectory. Um, I uh, started at UC Irvine. Um, I was a uh, chemistry major um, for my first year. And at the end of that first year, I was invited to find another major. Uh, I, I didn't do so well. And so that's OK. I, uh, they let me stay in school, which is great. Um, and I started to look for other majors that I could, uh, that I could be a part of. I found uh, comparative cultures, uh, which is which is what became the ethnic studies departments uh, once it was broken up uh, into four bodies. Um, and then I double majored uh, with sociology. And so my BA is in social science, but with those two majors. And um, like I said, my first year didn't go so well and that impacted my GPA. So I had to find uh, alternative routes to graduate school. Um, didn't really know what graduate school was about, but by the time I finished at UC Irvine, I realized, okay, so that your GPA matters. Um, my GPA wasn't so good. And then taking the graduate record exam, uh, that also matters. And I took a prep one and I wasn't doing so well. So I suppose I saw the writing on the wall and I, I started to look at uh, Cal State programs um, at, at the master's level in sociology. And what I noticed is that a lot of times those programs will look at your last two years. So I'm like, great, uh, my last two years are pretty good. Um, and I applied and I figured, well, if I can't make it through an MA program, then maybe a PhD program really isn't in, in the card. So I started at, at Dominguez Hills. Um, I did as well as I possibly could in my classes. I applied for uh, fellowships that were available uh, there at Dominguez Hills, scholarships, internships. I wrote a master's thesis. I basically did everything I could uh, to sort of uh, not only reinforce the, the idea that I wanted to get a PhD, but also um, I was sort of countering my undergraduate experience, which I came to learn that they would look at pretty harshly. So I thought, well, if I could show that I could do research, then uh, 
then maybe that, that would improve my chances. And uh, I applied twice to PhD programs. Um, I only got into one school my first year and decided I, I didn't want to let it ride in, in one program. So I, uh, I applied a second year. I, I got into Stony Brook. Um, it was tough. Uh, I, I graduated uh, in 2008 and then hit the job market, but then we had the financial crisis. So I was just, uh, I was working as an adjunct as a part-timer for four years. And then I, I found a job at uh, uh, Cal State uh, San Bernardino. Uh, next slide. So that's uh, my trajectory into the, uh, into the uh, Cal State uh, system. Um, I wanted to talk about the job market now. Uh, uh, next slide. So uh, there are a couple things you definitely want to pay attention to. Uh, teach a class. Um, it's really hard to argue. It, it, not in every case, but in a lot of cases that uh, you are ready to, to take on regular teaching, um, sometimes between uh, six and eight classes a year in the Cal State system, depending on the school that you're at. So you want to teach at least one class, publish a paper. Uh, Cal States are becoming increasingly more competitive and not having a, a publication um, is going to make it really tough. Uh, um, apply for grants, uh, you know, small ones, travel grants. I applied a lot of those. Uh, sometimes Haynes has opportunities, um, RAND, um, but small grants to show that you are interested in applying for um, external funding. Cal States are also interested in this. Uh, make sure you get your application in by the deadline. Um, some people might read a late application as uh, someone not serious about the position or as a sign that this person, you know, what is this person's sort of work ethic. So these are some things that you can attempt to do before you apply. All right, next slide. Um, <clears throat> so I got questions about uh, the cover letter um, and making a strong cover letter. Uh, some people asked about whether it had to be two pages or three pages. Uh, my cover letters were always over two, uh, two pages, but if you're stressed about the two page limit, then just write two pages and then have the sincerely yours part on the third page right at the top and then that way you get two full pages. Uh, you're gonna wanna start with your research focus to connect your research to what the job ad is asking, okay? Uh, again, the Cal States are interested in research, yeah? Um, describe after that your publications or papers that you have under review. Um, any special training, qualitative, quantitative, community-based, whatever extra training that you had or training that you've had in your PhD program, you're gonna to wanna to connect that in your, uh, in your cover letter. Uh, we also got questions about teaching uh, and cover letters. I think one of the things you wanna ask yourself is do you like to teach and maybe start that answer at the top. Um, it should be yes, if you wanna teach at a Cal State. Um, well, I suppose there are great teachers and people wanna teach at other institutions, but again, the Cal States have a lot of teaching that goes on and you wanna to signal to people that you're interested in teaching and dedicated to teaching. Uh, after that line, you describe your teaching experience. Uh, even if it's one class, you wanna describe it. Uh, the course is taught. And then courses you'd like to prepare for that institution. You'd wanna, after that part, describe your mentoring experience. Uh, if you were at McNair or Mellon Fell, you wanna describe that. Uh, if you want, if you were some sort of, if you were in some sort of internship program, you wanna describe that, right? At the Cal States, we're also interested in providing internship opportunities for students. Um, and so these are the kinds of things you can signal about your teaching in your cover letter, okay? Uh, and then finally, you can end with either some thoughts on uh, the training that you've had outside of your, your particular discipline, uh, maybe community-based or commu community-engaged work that you've done, uh, perhaps some policy interests that you have that your research connects to, okay? Uh, I didn't want to say too much about CVs, but you also want to take it, your time to review those as well. Again, you're going to want your research up front. Um, 
if you do have publications, you want a publication section. Uh, you want to be clear that you're about your publishing in journals, for example, or publishing uh, in chapters versus some other kind of content, right? You don't want a publication section and then you're listing a bunch of blog entries, which can be good, but it's, it's not appropriate for a publication section. You could create, let's say, if you were all sociologists, I'd say create a public sociology kind of section and put your blog entries there, right? And that's your signal that this is work for a wider audience interested in sociology. Um, one other tip, uh, I mean, you want to list your classes and grants and that kind of thing, uh, service work. Um, one other thing that I've seen errors, uh, seen errors on is people will give, give or present at conferences and per, use the same title for a number of conferences. Uh, don't do that. I think a lot of people don't care. A lot of associations don't care, but some faculty might care and, and and it's because some associations bar you or at least warn you about using the same title across different kinds of presentations across different associational conferences. Okay, so that's cover letters. All right, I wanted to move on to, okay, let's say uh, you make it onto a short, uh, a long short list, which is around 25 people, let's say. All right, next slide. From that 25 people, uh, they're going to pick. Um, uh, let's say uh, 10 people, uh, 10 people to phone interview or Zoom interview, okay? Um, that's pretty typical. Some do 15. Um, for the Zoom interviews, uh, you're going to want a professional look, okay? Uh, some people pay attention to that, that, in my opinion, more so than it's needed, but you're going to want to look professional, uh, business professional, I suppose you could stay. Uh, you're going to want to review the job ad. Uh, before that interview, you know, how does your particular um, uh, profile fit the job ad, you know, and try to answer or group uh, how you connect to that job ad in different places. Uh, look up campus info, you know, how many, you know, a lot of these institutions, all these institutions have um, institutional research uh, bodies, okay, that conduct research on a regular basis on their student body. So, you can find first-gen students. You can find how many social majors, for example, a department has. Um, uh, how many students commute to campus, okay? So you wanna uh, search the website of these campuses and try to get a feel as best you can for that campus. Um, definitely look at the department. Um, definitely look at the courses being offered, okay? And then see what courses you might be able to, to fill and then what might be the gaps, okay? Uh, be ready to talk about your research uh, and manuscripts uh, that you've created, um, right? As I said, Cal States are interested in research and you're gonna be asked, what is your research trajectory? Someone, some, someone might even say, what is your research trajectory over the next five years, okay? Um, so you're gonna want some idea. Um, be ready for the, how would you teach question? How would you teach X question? So. Let's say uh, we're talking about a sociologist, I'll use that as an example again, and an, uh, a PhD student who's on the market for a job has only taught intro to sociology, but their research is in family studies or gender. You're gonna be asked uh, most likely, how would you teach a family course? Okay, you're gonna want an answer to that question. So Google some family, uh, uh, sociology of the family, for example, syllabi, right? You should be able to find those to get some idea about how you might want to teach your course, um, have some idea about uh, the content that you might cover, maybe a, a book or two that you might cover, uh, what might the assignments be like, um, will you have discussion, that sort of a thing, um, and connected to this idea that you want to teach a family journal, uh, sociology of the family studies kind of course. Uh, some, uh, in some interviews, you might, you might get the question, what makes you the right fit uh, for this campus? Some of these questions are really hard to ask. I would say that that's one of the, the really difficult ones. Um, uh, for Cal State, I, I would say that your, your teaching style or your willingness to work with, your, your, your excitement to work with first gen or working class scholars or young scholars or students, that kind of a thing. So connected to teaching, um, it's probably the easiest way to, to begin to address that question. But, 
uh, people are interested in, in, in fit and what makes you think uh, uh, the right fit for that campus. But it's a really tough question. That's why I think looking at the campus info might give you a sense of how you might fit. Um, and some of, the, some of the reasons why they ask that is, well, if you come from a, a, a gigantic uh, public research institution like UCLA, well, what, what, what makes your experience at UCLA relevant for an experience uh, like at a Cal State San Bernardino, which is in the suburbs, right? So uh, I, I think it's that, it's that sense that they're trying to get about whether someone would be interested in living in the suburbs, okay? Um, and someone might leave their uh, uh, big city urban experience for a suburb. I mean, San Bernardino is quite huge. The metropolitan area is quite huge, but that's sort of, uh, I mean, these are different kinds of uh, communities, yes? Okay. Uh, finally, for your phone interview, come up with at least one question. You're always going to get asked, what question do you have? Uh, I would say don't ask about the teaching load necessarily. Um, and don't ask about the size of classes necessarily, okay? Uh, because most likely there are going to be a lot of classes that you have to teach, right? You should know that going in. And the student, the size of the students uh, per class could be somewhere between 25 and 70, depending on the institution, okay? So next slide. So let's say you get through the phone interview and uh, you get invited to campus. Typically, uh, most institutions invite at least two, but it could be as many as four or five, okay? So your campus visit, uh, you're gonna have to demonstrate your research. So prepare uh, what you wrote on for your dissertation, or let's say an article that you wrote or working on a presentation that you worked on for a conference. And that can begin to serve the basis for your presentation. Uh, the presentation most likely would be about a half hour to 40 minutes, depending on what they want to see. And then you could expect questions afterwards about your particular topic. Um, uh, a tip here, you might want to decide whether you're going to do this standing up or sitting down. Uh, sometimes people are asked, uh, or you can just, you're asked in the moment, do you want to stand or sit? Uh, and, and so you're gonna wanna, wanna practice in one of those two methods at least, yeah. Um, you're gonna be asked to give a teaching demo. Um, and uh, you're gonna wanna come up with the class activity. Uh, when I interviewed at Cal State San Bernardino, I did a classroom level activity. So everyone was involved in a sense uh, um, in the activity. I actually had two of them. Um, one at the beginning and one towards the end. One involved a series of images that people had to judge. And then the second one involved looking at census data um, based on zip codes. Uh, and so you're gonna wanna come up with that. Um, there's a trend I've noticed in my time at uh, Cal State San Bernardino that uh, people are given a lot of, uh, people are doing a lot of group exercises. So they break up the classroom into groups, fine. Um, if that's your style, you should do it. But just uh, if you're going to do that, don't stand there and watch the groups sort of do their activity. Walk around the room, check in, because if you're just sort of standing there looking at what's going on, I mean, there's really no engagement. So you're losing the entire uh, force behind what you're trying to do there and show what you're capable of. Okay. Um, and if you are going to do this kind of activity, don't forget to lecture. And if you're going to, and if you're going to lecture, it should be a, a reasonably long lecture. It shouldn't be basically three or four slides of lecture and then move on to your group activity because you want to show that you can do both if, you're, you're, if your goal is to show both kinds of research. Okay. Uh, next slide. So you're going to meet with faculty. Um, you're going to want to look them up if they uh, do research. You can do a Google search or a Google Scholar search your opportunity to learn about the faculty. If, if all you're doing is talking, then you're doing something wrong because you should be asking the faculty about what they do. Um, sometimes a general Google Scholar search isn't going to work and you're going to want to do a more expansive search. Um, for those faculty that you, that you don't find research on, then you can ask about their teaching, but you're going to want to make sure you get to know them or try to get to know them. Uh, next slide. Uh, You'll be asked to go to breakfast, lunch, and dinners, and you know your the best bet is just to go with the flow. Uh, most places will ask you about your preferences for food. 
Um, and then during this time, they'll ask you, you know, about about your work a little a little bit more, but perhaps perhaps hobbies. Um, it also could be time for you to ask where people live generally um, in the area. Okay. Uh, next slide. But in that in that, uh, I mean, it isn't a time to totally relax, but uh, you know, it is more of a relaxed environment. Parting tips from your campus visits. Uh, you may not get a lot of downtime, so have some water on you, some snacks perhaps. Um, you never know given the institution and their schedule. Uh, your campus visit could be over two days and make sure you email everyone you met with uh, a thank you, a thank you note. Um, now I wanna move on quickly to the do's and don'ts of my talk for today. Um, uh, so you want to search calstate.edu, Chronicle for Higher Ed, and if you're a sociologist, Sociology Rumorville for jobs that are out there, um, it's a good place to start. Uh, if you're uh, lecturing in, front of, in, in a classroom for your demo, make sure you don't stand the entire time behind the podium. Make sure you get out in front of people, uh, in front of the classroom and, and walk around a bit, okay? It matters. Uh, look interested in, uh, look interested in the position while you're on your campus visit, okay? Uh, fake it until you make it, right? That kind of a thing. Uh, <clears throat> attend, we got a lot of questions about regional, uh, about networks. Uh, one place to start is at uh, presenting at regional uh, uh, conferences like California Sociological Association, the Pacific Sociological Association, okay? Um, there you meet a lot of people. Like if, uh, if I had the time, if I did my job search over, uh, going back in time, I would have presented at the CSA and the PSA because a lot of Cal State people show up uh, at those conferences and I could have met more people, uh, which might have uh, made me more competitive when I was on the job market, okay? Uh, serve the discipline if you can. A lot of these associations, I realize they cost money, but they are looking for people to uh, do service work. And also your graduate institutions and your universities also are looking for people to volunteer for stuff. Uh, when you ask for letters of rec, ask, ask people who know you and your work, right? So they can write a strong letter. All right, then very quickly, some don'ts. Uh, when you're on your visit, don't tell people you already have an offer, okay? Uh, save that for some other time after the campus visit, okay? Uh, that's gonna sour people to your visit right away, okay? You can hint that you have other interviews, that's perfectly fine, but uh, don't tell people you already got a job, basically, okay? That's a, it's not a good move. Uh, don't comment on how far people walk, right? Uh, uh, sorry, drive to school, commute, yeah? Um, it's Cal State system, a lot of people live in different areas. We are a commuter culture for sure, yeah, in California. So uh, it can come off as a little obnoxious if you sort of make a big deal about where someone commutes uh, from, yeah? Uh, me, for example, yeah, I commute pretty far. Uh, don't ask about the crime rate. Um, I realize people are concerned about the crime rate, and if you're going to ask, I, I, I really don't know how you would do this, be, re be really nice about it. Uh, uh, I, I, I find a, a professional way to ask. I don't know what that is, but definitely don't start talking about uh, articles, newspaper stories that you found about the crime rate in a particular area. It's not going to, it's not going to go over well. Uh, don't sign in to someone's uh, account uh, in your Zoom interview with someone else's uh, email or account number, uh, account name. Uh, you should be signing in as yourself, okay? Because uh, that's going to come off a little weird. Uh, receipts, save all your receipts, but don't include non-essential kinds of things. So if you buy a gift, for example, uh, for someone while you're traveling, you don't include it that in the receipts that the department which is paying for your travel to reimburse you on, okay? Uh, so that's it for do's and don'ts. Uh, Jacqueline has some uh, Jacqueline has some questions uh, for me, and then we'll address any other questions that are left over. Okay, Jacqueline, take it away. Thank you for that amazing presentation. Okay, so how does an interdisciplinary ethnic studies degree factor into job opportunities? Uh, right now, I would say it's huge. Uh, in California, for example, I'm, I'm hopeful that the ethnic studies requirement uh, for the Cal States, for example, is going to lead to more than just part-time jobs, that institutions will begin to uh, 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 create positions 
departments, uh, grow departments so that we can include more ethnic studies kinds of faculty, uh, faculty that have an ethnic studies degree or an ethnic studies emphasis. Um, secondly, uh, given the social movement, uh, insurrection, protest um, uh, that we've seen uh, uh, in the spring, uh, that I believe has motivated more hiring in this area. Um, I've seen a lot of cluster hire jobs. You can Google Portland State University and they've, they're hiring a ton of people right now. And so there are a lot of opportunities uh, this year, and I'm imagining going to be next year, to get more ethnic studies faculty in ethnic studies programs. Uh, and then uh, if you look at uh, the few sociology jobs that are out there, there are a number of jobs that are looking for people that study African American uh, communities, diasporas, Latino communities, Native American communities, you name it, okay? Asian American communities, right? The four major ethnic studies groups that uh, you study, that you can study here at UCLA. Okay, and then lastly, if you're a sociologist and anthropologist, but you also have this uh, area that you've developed, let's call it Latino studies um, or uh, uh, black diaspora studies, right? That gives you more opportunities to, to apply for different kinds of jobs, right? You could apply for a sociology job, an anthropology job, anthropology job, but you could also apply for an ethnic studies position looking for that particular uh, uh, area. Okay, so I think there are a lot. And then uh, I guess finally, a lot of deans like to hear this term interdisciplinary, right? They encourage it, they promote it. They like to see that their faculty are doing this. So this is something that you can mention in your cover letter, right? Your training in interdisciplinary kinds of work, right? Very important. Um, and then a lot of you, uh, deans, presidents wanna see that students from other parts of campus are taking your classes, right? And part of that has to do with the draw that you might have across different kinds of communities, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you for answering that. The next question we have is, how does a professor at a Cal State University make time and gain resources to do research? Well, there are a lot of internal uh, grants um, that give, what, give you what's called a release or a buyout. Um, and so let's say your course schedule is teaching three classes per semester. You get a buyout that brings you down to teaching three classes, one class a semester and two classes another, okay? Um, and so part of it becomes you hustling for these extra money. So there are monies out there to work with students. You, get a, you can get a buyout for more service to the, the campus that you're working in terms of working with students, mentorship or some other kind of work. Uh, there can be buyouts for community-based work, for example, and teaching, okay? Uh, and then there are summer research opportunities that encourage faculty to do writing, okay? There are those kinds of grants. Um, depending on, the, uh, so in the Cal State system, we also have for incoming faculty for the first two years. I'm not sure what it is in the semester system because I'm, I'm off this year, but I, I think the faculty get somewhere between two to three courses off per year. So if our full uh, teaching load is eight classes and that brings you down to five. Okay, and so that's supposed to be so that you can do more research, right, and apart from prepping your classes. Um, and so that, that would be the, I mean, then, and then the other thing is that they do encourage um, uh, applying for external grants. So applying for this position at UCLA is huge. Um, and I will say it was only likely once I had a, a chair who was willing to support this kind of move and a dean that was willing to support this kind of, of effort. So it takes a lot of hustle. There are also some campus, let's just call it politics stuff that goes on. But there are, I, I apply, uh, 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 there are, there's also a, a, a Haynes Faculty Fellowship grant that I'm looking into for next year, um, possibly um, that people can apply to. Uh, and so, so that would be a major difference. And then the other is that uh, the teaching load at a Cal State is, is uh, quite high, I've already said it. And I, I'm imagining that in the UC system, it's somewhere between two to five, but I'm imagining that, I mean, I don't know, but I'm imagining that the opportunities to buy yourself out of the class is a little bit higher. And then you're also at a very prestigious institution. So your competitiveness to apply for, let's say a Haynes Faculty Fellowship 
or an NSF grant is much higher than let's, some, let's say someone applying from a Cal State. So those are some of the differences. And then the third one is that you, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time with students, not just teaching, office hours, mentorship, uh, committees that serve students. Um, you're gonna be asked to do a lot of committee work. Um, you know, I, I'm sure people at R1s at UCLA, they're doing a lot of committee work, but uh, one thing that I'm finding at, at folks that, uh, at, at a lot of uh, teaching intensive institutions that they're, they're doing a lot of committee work. So that would be a th uh, uh, the final one, that there's a lot of service to students that, that you, have to, you have to get done. Um, and you might be singled out to do it. And I think the term is being ball and told. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so your response definitely leads into our next question. What makes a career different from an academic career in a research one institution? Yeah, at a research one institution, I mean, from what I heard and from what I saw as being a PhD student at Stony Brook, which uh, has, a, has an okay reputation, um, uh, you are required to do a lot of research uh, on a regular basis at a research one, right? Um, you are expected to do so. Uh, um, I, I don't want to guess at what is the publication expectations per year, but I, I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's a yearly one, whatever that might be. Um, I, I don't think this is true in every single case, obviously, but I think the expectation that you're writing a book and from what I noticed at my own institution, Stony Brook, is that you didn't get tenure unless you wrote a book. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, the only way I'm ever writing a book is with like 10 other people. So uh, the possibility for me to do that, I mean, <laughs> uh, not very high, but I, I think that is one. Uh, as I said, in the Cal State system, you, uh, you have to do a lot of research. It is expected. And like I said, it's becoming more competitive and on research tasks. I mean, you're not gonna get, you're, you're, it's gonna be hard to get tenure if you're not a good teacher, but, and that's what everyone's looking for, but you are gonna have to do research. You are gonna have to get published. And I guess the best line I heard, uh, and I'm not trying to dissuade anyone, but uh, the Cal State experience uh, now is, is like, publish like you're at a UC, uh, teach like you're at a junior college. And the joke, what the joke is trying to get at is at a junior college, you're teaching somewhere between um, more than eight classes, okay? And so that is a lot of teaching, very, leaves very little time for research. And then at a, at a junior college, you're doing a lot of teaching plus a lot of service. And so it makes sense that, that, I mean, you're lucky if you get to go to a conference, let alone have funding to go to a conference. So, so that is a very marked ex different experience from uh, let's say being at, at a research one institution is that research priority, okay? Uh, thank you. Can you clarify what a junior college is? Just a junior college or community college, a two-year institution, yeah, where you know the faculty are there to to do a lot of teaching, right? Um, and I think the opportunities for buyouts are, are relatively small. Okay. Thank our you. next question is: What are alternative academic options for scholars, and what are some ways to make that pivot? Great question. Um, I was looking forward to to uh, answering questions like this, because uh, if you follow me on Twitter uh, in April, there's gonna be an event where sociologists uh, that are in non-academic positions are gonna serve on a panel. Uh, it's gonna cost 20 bucks for non-members, so sorry about that, but it's gonna explain the experiences of non-academics, uh, uh, non-academics in nonprofit roles, government roles, uh, corporate roles, okay? And they're gonna talk about their particular experience. And then the first gen and working class uh, task force is gonna have a special workshop at the beginning of the conference in August, okay? Um, it's gonna be virtual for non-members. Uh, you have to pay 50 bucks in order to attend, but um, it is a great opportunity to learn from first gen and working class scholars about the trajectory they've had out of academia. There are things you can do. Uh, some are gonna cost money, right? Uh, you could attend something like the community-based particip participatory research uh, University of New Mexico workshop, which is held in June. This year, they're not doing it, but it teaches people how to develop 
community-based participatory research projects, right? Which is something that a lot of nonprofits want, okay? Um, there's also the Evaluation Institute, uh, which has a minor minority-serving institu uh, institute uh, program for graduate students and for faculty, where you learn about evaluation research, right? How do you evaluate whether an educational program at your local elementary school is working? Well, you need, in part, an academic that could come in there and work with faculty, uh, work with teachers uh, to assess that kind of process. Okay, um, there is the opportunities through RANDs uh, that are competitive through the summer to learn about policy. Um, I think one of the ways is to is to do these kinds of skill building um, uh, opportunities that are available through different organizations, but they're they're competitive or they cost. Yeah. Or you could spend time during your master's or uh, another graduate work, uh, developing your qualitative skills further, uh, developing your quantitative skills, or any other methodology or approach to collecting information um, or expressive form that you think is relevant that a nonprofit or government institution might begin to uh, 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 find useful. Um, the last example I have is uh, you could uh, do an internship. Most of these are non-paid. Um, so as a graduate student, I get it doing non-paid work. Uh, but, you know, it, uh, academia is getting more competitive. Um, and I, I think it is a good idea when possible to do some sort of internship at a local institution. Maybe you're a consulting on research, maybe you're developing research, or maybe you're just working as an intern. Um, uh, that, that is a possibility, but again, those kinds of opportunities are often unpaid. But I do think that there are a lot of opportunities. You can, you can search the American Sociological Association website. They collect data, publish papers that are downloadable, and you can see the kinds of academic opportunities uh, outside of academia that people are, are using. But, I guess the, the big takeaway would be develop an area that focuses on uh, either writing, right, right, editing, research uh, skills, um, consulting skills, grant writing skills, right? Those are the kinds of jobs that people find, um, right? It's not uncommon, for example, for an anthropologist to be working in an ad firm, yeah, um, right? Firms in New York, right, the gigantic ones, they have anthropologists collecting data in people's homes um, about what they consume, when they consume it, right? So those opportunities are there. It's, it, it's, it's really hard to find mentorship into those areas. That's why I think these opportunities that I've mentioned through the American Sociological Association would be quite helpful and give you a start of where to begin. Um, uh, if uh, you could also look at your institution, whether they have a community-based or community engagement kind of institution, they should by now, um, and then talk to them about what's possible as a graduate student. What could you do to build on your community engage or community investment kind of work? Thank you. Awesome. So we did receive five additional questions from oh, the today. Um, so I will try to quickly run through them because we're running out of time. But we all know that COVID has affected and shifted the way we do things. Um, how has that affected the CSU job market? Well, uh, this year, Cal State San Bernardino is hiring. Uh, they're not hiring in sociology because we decided to wait a year uh, or so. Uh, but the CSUs, uh, on our, the departments on our campuses are hiring. Um, I think they're not hiring as much as uh, uh, last year or the year before, um, but there are, are there are uh, jobs out there. Uh, there are just not that many in sociology, but like I said, there are ethnic studies positions. Um, I'm really hopeful that next year will be much better now that the, we have the vaccine. And uh, I, I think I think this is an important question because we, I mean, in some ways we don't know what is the budget going to be for next year. Obviously. Um, Right, Cal State enrollments are lower than UC enrollments right now. How's that going to impact money set aside for budget for hiring? It's really hard to say, but but given that that our campus, for example, is hiring, and that I have seen jobs, 
at other Cal States. I'm hopeful that, that that'll continue. Thank you. Okay, and the other COVID related question is, what if someone wants to teach, what if what someone wants to teach is different from the topic of their dissert, dissertation? Sorry, cannot pronounce that. Dissertation, um, yeah, sure. And they had to get creative because of COVID. Uh, any teaching you can do uh, is huge. Um, uh, any teaching that you can get get experience on is gonna be big. Uh, I, I, again, uh, it, these are competitive jobs, uh, uh, definitely among the veteran faculty, there is this sort of like, well, uh, what, how has this person been in the classroom? What's, what's their record in the classroom? You know, are they ready to take on five classes their first year and five classes the second year and then transition into more classes after that? So I wouldn't worry about, about that uh, too much. That's why it's important so that uh, once you get to uh, writing your cover letter, make sure you explain what kind of classes you would teach that fit your particular area. And then if you make the Zoom interview, phone interview, you know, have a clear idea about how your research fits the class that you wanna, uh, the call for jobs and the teach the, the class that, the, the classes that they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, that's very important. So don't worry, any experience is, is, is phenomenal. Okay, um, so we do have three additional questions. Okay, um, well, let's just keep going. Okay, so please bear with us. We want to make sure. Or you can go. This is going to be recorded. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> wrap up these questions. Yeah. Okay, so this person mentioned, or they're asking, what kind of opportunities exist for someone who has a long-term K through twelve who has been a long-term K through 12 educator and would like to advance in their career, they have a master's in educational administration. Well, uh, if you're interested in teaching um, and just getting out there, I would start looking for calls for uh, jobs at uh, um, junior colleges um, and come up with a, a, C, a, a resume and cover letter and uh, um, and submit it and see, they're looking for people all the time. Um, uh, and you get into the pool and then let's say you get lucky and they say, okay, let's see if this person's ready to teach. I mean, you do have teaching experience. So uh, it would, you'd have to be, uh, you'd have to develop your particular uh, cover letter to match what, what's being taught. And if, if what you're hoping is to be a faculty member, then I mean, that, 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 in most cases is gonna require a PhD. Uh, and so you're, you're gonna to wanna to start looking into those programs, but there are plenty of junior colleges, community colleges that need faculty. Um, um, Rebecca, are we, we short on time now? <laughs> are we okay? Well, as, as you said, we are recording, but um, we should probably wrap up. Maybe one more okay. question? Uh, well, let me just say one more thing is that a lot of conferences have teaching pedagogy kinds of sessions. So you should look into those if you can. Okay, so let's go with one more and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so the last question is for folks who can't afford to adjunct and have had to get a full-time job outside of academia for stability reasons, post mm -hmm. a PhD, is there a possibility for them to return to academia or be a competitive candidate for a CSU faculty position? And what are some suggestions? Well, uh, if you can, uh, this would, I mean, if you try to find an online class, I suppose, or if there's any breaking, or, there, are, there are a lot of intercessions uh, in between the first and second semester, but that are very intensive. There's summers, uh, but I, I, I would try to find a way to teach at least one class because I, I, I think it would be too competitive without, without at least that, um, uh, unless you had some advanced pedagogical training at your PhD institution it would be pretty hard. Uh, I mean, I, I would go for it either way, but uh, I mean, not, not every institution uh, is gonna bar you, I mean, or look at, look, look down on that, but, but uh, it makes you more competitive when you have a job, when you have a, a teaching, teaching experience, okay? So thank you. And uh, we'll take it over to uh, Rebecca. Okay, um, I think we, we have a final slide we're going to put up with um, our contact information and social media handles. 
But I'd like to thank you, Dr. Munoz, and thank you everyone no for attending and, um, and for your great questions. Um, we will be sending out a link to a Google form through Eventbrite uh, because we would love your feedback about this event. Uh, we will also be posting the video recording on the YouTube channels of both CSRC and um, UCLA alumni, and that'll be in the next few days. Um, in the meantime, you're always welcome to engage with us on our social media channels and through email. So thank you everyone and have a good evening. All right, thanks everybody, take care.